Mia. Welcome to Dying to Live. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, my pleasure, Kristen. Good to see you again. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited just to share a little time with you to see your face and, and to talk about things that I know we're both really passionate about. And um, maybe just a little bit about how we know each other. Um, so I met you when I had a, a brief stint from my, my current corporate job and I was working for a sexual health and wellness retailer called Lovers, um, which is now um, owned by Playboy, interestingly. Uh -huh. um, and you were a resource for a lot of awesome content. And I feel like we we barely got started when I was there and then a lot of things shifted, but, um, but we stayed connected, which I've loved. So yeah. excited to have you here now. No, my pleasure. And it was so wonderful to, uh, to have that opportunity to meet you. I think it was like four years ago, right? Like th uh -huh. three or four years ago. Um, and that was a fun and like really awesome learning experience for me to, to be a partner there. And, um, and has launched a lot of great creative uh, opportunities and uh, ways to pro provide sexuality education in many dynamic ways. So what a learning experience. And it's been awesome to keep in touch with you two throughout the years and get to know each other personally as well as professionally. So, And I'm so thrilled to be on this podcast. I think it's so awesome and um, get to share a bit about what I, what I know and where our worlds overlap, which I'm thrilled about. Yeah, I love that. So maybe a little scene setting. Can we Talk a little bit about kind of how you got started in this work, um, where where you started, how it led you to where you are now, and, and all of that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my license is in marriage and family therapy. And as a couple therapist, I'm trained to, to, to work at, you know, primarily with couples and realizing there was such a um, gap in awareness, a gap in literature and research and exploration of, uh, of sex and how sex shows up um, in terms of problems that relationships have. Uh, and then, you know, even that term couples is very limiting, right? So um, where do folks who are non-monogamous uh, fit in there? Where do folks who are kinky fit in there? And I know you and I will get into a little bit throughout this today, um, but I, I definitely felt that it was important if I was going to work in the world of therapy, particularly with relationships that I get uh, really familiar and comfortable and um, experienced talking about sex and intimacy and identity. And in the past couple of years, I've, I've learned a lot from folks like Bianca Loriano, who has been a sexuality educator supervisor of mine around intersectionality and social locations. And it's really informed the work that I do now, seeing um, clients through the lenses of queer theory and being a student of disability justice and transformative justice and intersectionality and definitely I'm a student and still learning and, and being humble in that learning. Um, but inviting that into the work I do in my clinical, in my clinical work with clients, which I love. I know it, you and I talk about that, that I have like the greatest job. I, I really believe I have the greatest, greatest job. I love it so much. Um, it's very rewarding in many, many different ways. Oh my gosh. Well, just the, the, the broadness of your education and all the things that you are personally interested in and, and the passion that you bring to the work and the number of people that you're able to help guide and touch through through your work, I think is really phenomenal in helping to to change people's lives and relationships with themselves and others. Thank you, Kristen. I, I, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, and and I know one of the areas that you're really passionate about just is kind of the the diverse landscape, right, of gender and sexuality. Um, and I think this idea of, of fluidity or, or how these things are, are on a spectrum and, and not binary is something that is still a hot topic and something that not everyone is, is familiar with yet. Um, I know that in my personal life, I have a lot of conversations about it and I'd love to know kind of what comes through in your work and when you have these conversations with people, the realizations that they have and how it affects their lives. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So many questions in that. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to explore the differences between gender identity, relationship, romantic orientation, sexual orientation, gender expression, and how all of these intersect with each other 
and throughout our lives, each of those, and I can go into some definitions if it would be helpful, but each of those has a beautiful opportunity to shift and change. Like sexual orientation can change uh, and, and is often very fluid throughout sometimes the day, let alone a lifetime. And the same mm-hmm. with gender expression. Uh, sometimes I feel a lot more um, into dressing femme and wearing lipstick. And other times I'm like rocking a bow tie, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. as a queer person who has done a lot of work to embody and get comfortable and practice radical self-love, which Mm -hmm. takes a lot of intentionality and time and effort. Like I, I have like a, um, I feel like this is a, an area I feel very solid in. And so working with clients who are exploring who they are at any given moment, who they want to be and why is, it's just a gift. It's a, it's a total honor. I think in our world, we're so socialized in the binary, right? It was like this construction of male, female, a duality, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that people are so, so stuck in. And if we can dismantle this and queer it up and question and, and explore uh, what's outside of this binary, not just what may be in the middle of a spectrum, but what's outside of the boxes that society creates and tells us that we have to check off or put ourselves into. There's just so much uh, like color and life and vibrance. And I think that's where like soul can, can come from. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. just even having the permission to to understand that 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 the spectrum exists for all of these things and it can change in a day, you know, never mind a life over the course of a lifetime is like mm-hmm. mind blowing. My mind is a little bit blown right now. Yeah. Well, even with an appetite, uh, one of my one of my um, mentors is Midori, who is mm-hmm. a sexuality educator and a kink specialist, and she talks about how kink, and the, this is her definition, which I love when I teach this, I love teaching it. Kink is childhood joyous play with adult sexual uh, privilege and cool toys, right? And there's this like fabulous definition that gives so much to um, to the joy, right? That comes from, um, from exploration and from appetite. And she talks about kink not as BDSM, not as I am a dominant or I am a submissive, right? It's an appetite. And appetites change and they shift and they grow. And if we can get really curious about what at any given moment are our yeses or our noes or our maybes or yes if, right? Um, in negotiation or conversation with others, then I mean, what free, that's like liberation, it's freedom. Oh my gosh, so liberating. And I, I love following her because to your point, um, the amount of time that she spends talking about play and how this is all fun, right? And, and sex can also be such a serious topic in this culture. Um, but at the end of the day, like thinking about it like childhood fun, like the desire that I used to have to go to the swimming pool as an eight-year-old, right? And how, how much I was driven by that and the mm-hmm. satisfaction that I got from actually doing that activity mm-hmm. translates so perfectly, but we never, we don't talk about it that way often enough. No, absolutely. And if we can invite that we are like human beings, regardless of age, if we can invite that play and that joy and tapping into what's fun. um, I mean, I think that's that's kind of the goal, right? Yeah. Yes. Opening up more avenues of fun and something like, I know we're going to get into this in a different episode, but something like BDSM, which can be I think super intimidating if you've never explored it before, but, but reframing that as just an exploration of fun. What a great oh, yeah. way to broaden your horizons. hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I am looking, I'm looking, I'm so happy to be in this episode. I'm also very much looking forward to the, to the Kink and BDSM episode. It's going to be a lot of fun. Me too. I'm going to, I'm going to learn a lot for sure. Um, in that I'm wondering too, um, in, in your own personal journey, what were the things that helped um, you really empower that radical self-love and to embrace more of the spectrum within yourself? I think where I would go with that or where I'm going with that is to invite people into my life, whether as teachers, mentors, supervisors, colleagues, um, who hold different identities um, and uh, 
uh, and to establish really wonderful relationships with people who I look up to, people mm -hmm. I, I can be vulnerable with, people who will hold me accountable when I'm not in alignment with my values, when my actions are in an alignment with the values that I hold, right, which is integrity. Um, to me, that's how I define integrity. And uh, to choose humility over like defensiveness. So um, I'm a very big, like the way I identify is I've got lots of identities that, that I hold, but one of them is as an introverted relationship slut. Like I am super introverted and I love relationships. I love them. <laughs> I love relationships so much. And so finding uh, people who are um, just incredible in, in various ways and getting to know them and us having a, a beautiful dynamic has been just like life-changing, life-changing. And I imagine I'm going to be sharing different names and resources with you throughout the episode and afterward. Um, but really a community community mm -hmm. has. And I think human beings are like, so we're just so terrified of what we don't understand. And mm -hmm. so if we're run by fear, which so many people are, um, and then comparison, right. And judgment, which is like, that is just surrounded by shame that mm -hmm. creates shame. Then it limits us and creates a barrier to self-love and self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. Um, and so also I'm a huge nerd. And so reading a lot, listening to podcasts, um, Sonny Renee Taylor, I have like her book right here. Cause I want to make sure I like really plug it, um, has been, you know, it's like a wonderful, fabulous book to, to read about radical self-love come as you are. I've got on, I think, you know, this on my website, a ton of books that I highly recommend. Um, and so diving into learning and being really curious and, and open to, um, learning about other people's experiences and really letting that sink in and doing a lot of introspection. Yeah, I love that. We're going to link to your to your site in the show notes too. And we'll also okay. name it at the end so that people can jump on and look at the resources that you have listed there in addition to what you might note today. Um, one of my words for this for this year is curiosity. And I'm, I'm trying to apply that to, to everything, right? And so one of the ways that I've started to look for new community and new folks to work with is um, if they have a subject matter or there's there's something about them that, that I'm deeply unfamiliar with mm -hmm. um, that I can get curious about and then learn learn along the way and and bring in a wider worldview through that. Um, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And alongside is openness to like, you've got to have willingness and openness to even explore that curiosity. And I think it takes courage. Oh, yeah. courage. thank you for saying yeah. that. I think, I think so too. Um, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to open yourself to something new, especially with all of the ways that we've been programmed in our society and our in our family of origin and some of the other ways that that come in throughout our lives that kind of keep us in a box. I think that's like, that's a really important one. Um, I don't know if we want to, well, I'm just going to go into it, that yeah. as the like intimacy and relationship sex therapist, um, so important, so integral to this work is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I think it's, Esther Prowler, Brene Brown says like, you can't have intimacy without vulnerability. We, mm -hmm. we just like can't get there. Um, and there's so many barriers to feeling safer, right? Or safe enough to show up with vulnerability. And so that we can't even access that curiosity piece, right? And so, so often folks will come into my office well with like a defensiveness, which is rooted in white supremacy, mm -hmm. right? And um, and so much of, of what we get to do is really unpack where this is coming from, what's the fear behind it, mm -hmm. um, so that we can get to that, that en enough vulnerability and safer um, atmosphere and creating that co-creation of safety, really, so that we can explore opportunities for intimacy. And there's so many, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunities to create intimacy in relationships. So, yeah, but then again, it's like rooted in as Sonny Renee Taylor talks about the isms and the obias, right? Like, mm. and then the patriarchy too. And so all of those isms and obias that have influenced and impacted the messages that we receive 
from our families of origin, from culture around us, and then create shame. And that creates the barriers. And if we can get curious and open about all of the isms and obias around us that are impacting us and informing the way that we feel, think, believe, right? Then yeah. we can take the shackles off, right? Then we can uh, experience um, uh, a better awareness and understanding and growth and freedom. Yeah, what's occurring to me right now too is the common thread of communication and how important communication is in all of this as well. Um, and I'm sure that comes up in your work all the time. Yeah, it's so funny when when folks that you know in the intake they're like, "Wait, what's your what's your goal for ther- therapy? Well, so to improve communication." talk about curiosity. I get super curious about what does that mean? What does communication mean to person A is going to be totally different to person B, right? What are the deficits in communication? What are the limits? Like what, what is it that's happening where two people or three people or four people, right? Are, are having a struggle with it. Um, and so really getting curious about even the definition of communication can be illuminating. Oh my gosh. I mean, also what's striking me right now is this, this work isn't just about sex. This work is about how you navigate life as a whole, how you exchange energy as a whole and a million other topics. Yeah, totally. And for, for many folks that's synonymous with sex, right? But it is, you like nailed it, that sex therapists, it's in a I'll, well speak about what's in my hula hoop, right? As, as a, a sex therapist, how I view this work is um it's like spiritual right it's it is about getting to know the self and how we show up in the world um navigating in terms of polyvagal theory like fight flight freeze fawn dissociate like how we interact with trauma how what happens when we're triggered what are that what are the values that we hold and where did they come from you know Mm -hmm. like emily nagowski author of Come As You Are and Burnout talks about, and I kind of neophyze this a little bit, but she talks about how we are born with these like plots of land, right? As plots of land and our families of origin throw a bunch of seeds in them, right? And they grow into different uh, oak trees and tomato plants and orchids and blah, blah, blah. And some are these insidious like uh, vines, right? Or weeds. And we, as, as a sex therapist, my job is to help navigate what's a weed and what's an oak tree and like what's a tomato plant and what do you want to keep and what do you want to take out and then gently with client like weed that stuff out weed that stuff out so that the shame doesn't like permeate like it doesn't uh affect other other plants in the garden and then so you don't throw seeds in other people's garden that you don't necessarily want to be doing so that's, that's how I view the, the work that, um, yeah, sex is a component and it's an important piece. Um, it's like that isomorphic process you and I were talking about before we popped on here. Um, and it's also like a reflection, can all, often be a reflection, but it is its core, it's, it's spiritual. Yeah, so powerful. And, you know, we were gonna talk about today kind of the, how, embracing or maybe deepening our relationship with our sexual selves, the the other things that that can empower that maybe um, aren't readily, that we don't think of, right? And and that's certainly one of them, but I'm sure that there's more. One that occurred to me was, was creativity because our sexual energy and our creative energy come from the same source and fostering one helps the other grow as well. So much. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that shifts and changes over time. Right. Um, yeah, but if it, one thing that's showing up as you talk about that is like creativity and who has time for it. Right. And if we're in the hustle and bustle and in this capitalist, um, culture world, whatever, um, state turtle Island, right. Then, then we're in like a, like the hustle all the time. Right. We don't, we don't have that that time and space to offer the ourselves the capacity or the freedom to um, tap into creativity and it limits us. So just, just that in and of itself, like being aware of the role and the um, implication that the isms and the obias have on how we show up in the world and what we're allowed to, what we're 
offering ourselves and others Mm -hmm. um, can just be really, again, illuminating. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel that so much right now. And um, there were, obviously COVID was a devastating thing um, for many people, Mm -hmm. for many reasons. And also I think it caused us to slow down and to do life differently. And I have a pretty deep fear about returning to normalcy and how quickly we might forget that those in power might forget um, what that afforded us that was positive and go back to the way that we were. Um, So interested to see what happens on that front. I think there's, you know, that's again, getting curious about the role of power and oppression. Um, what do people in power do with that, right? And for what, for what purpose? Mm-hmm. Um, or and what are the values behind that? Yeah, I I too I have I have concerns about going back and and part of me doesn't think it's possible, in many different ways. Um, and then uh, you know other parts are are just wondering what things are going to start to look like. But I'm with you. Yeah. Do you have any ways that you um, personally kind of protect against some of this? So for instance, for me, um, a couple times a year, I will carve out vacation time that I'm privileged enough to have um, where I don't plan anything. So it might be a day or two days where the not planning thing is, is the least of it, but it is then like getting up in the morning and allowing my, my intuition to lead me as to what might be fulfilling throughout the day. So Mm -hmm. if that means I get up and I think I would like to have an ice cream Sunday right now, and then I would like to go swimming. And then I would like to do this. I allow that to happen, to bring that flow back in that is so restricted by, um, by our society and how work typically works. Oh my gosh. I like my brain is firing like 5 million different things right now. The first I want to say is how there's so much wisdom in what you just shared Mm -hmm. around inviting enough space to identify your yeses and your nos, right? Like so much like inviting awareness of, I want an ice cream sundae. I want to go for a walk. I want to hug my partner. Like I want to snuggle my, my puppy, right? Like they're like that, not that you see only said a couple of those things, right? The other things are stuff I want to do right now, but just like <laughs> that awareness of in the moment, like what it is that you want. If we can get in tune with that, um, that's some Betty Martin wheel of consent work, by the way, for folks who are listening and you're curious about consent and yeses and no's, but the reality is we can we trust someone's yes if we can't trust their no? Can we trust someone's no if we can't trust their yes? And, and what I'm hearing and what you just shared is, is this beautiful awareness of in, at any given moment, can we access what it is that we want? And then how do we then share that with the person like next to us or in front of us? Right. Like, I think that's like that core piece of consent. Yeah. But first, what I'm hearing from you is first, we have to be really clear on our own yeses and nos. And that has to happen at a really deep level so that it is automatic. And allowing the space, like what you were talking about, creating that opportunity so that you're not flooded with, I have to do this and this is my to-do list. And right. You're not, you're in the moment thinking about it. Right. And privilege of having time on vacation to be able to do that. But imagine a world where we could do that, where we could have have that space, where people could have that space to tap into the, their awareness of what it is that they want at any given moment. And then what it means to share that aloud to somebody who can witness that, who can hear you. Mm, it seems mm-hmm. like we could practice this in, in small ways throughout our day that would end up having a big impact too. You know, maybe Huge. it's, Maybe it's what you're going to have for lunch, or maybe you have a free half an hour and it's how you're going to spend that half an hour. And then you practice the communication of it with, with somebody else in your life. I love that. I invite clients to do that in session and have exercises about that. And I have an accountability buddy too, who, um, once a month we meet for X amount of time. And we practice some of these exercises where for five minutes, I share the things that I want and they share for five minutes, what they want. And we witness each other and it just is like 10 minutes. And then we go on to other exercises, but just in that space, 
it's it is it's an it's incredible um what ends up happening yeah wow wow i love that idea okay we're going to talk more about that too the next time um that we get together there's so much to dig into there um and i know i didn't answer your question i kind of forgot what the question was i don't even I know went into consent. okay i don't even know uh, it's all good okay cool um so I'm also interested in, you know, and I think people that listen would be interested in kind of the biggest struggles or areas of opportunity that you see come through the practice that, that you think, gosh, if only society did a better job of this, or if only we embraced this more then this recurring thing, I wouldn't see so much and people would feel so much better. What are some of those things? Yeah, I, I like totally I love this, this question. Um, so much comes up when you ask this question. It, it, well, really quickly, I want to kind of go into what a sex therapist does. And yeah. um, the areas that I end up working with are sexual shame, mm -hmm. uh, desire discrepancy, and kink non-monogamy, uh, sexual pain quite often. And so much of who comes to work with me, it is about these components and a lot of other things, right? But about these components um, that are so rooted in shame. And then shame, where does shame come from, right? Like early on, like babies aren't born with it. It's like created in from society, right? And from um, the messages that our parents have taught us growing up from an early age and that are informed by uh, culture around us. And so um, this is a very, it's like a big question that you're asking. <laughs> It takes like intentionality and depends on what, what each person is really presenting with, mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. But gosh, I mean, again, it's exploring the isms and the obias, exploring the messages that, that, are, that we receive growing up, um, recognizing like the power of identities too, mm -hmm. um, and how we know what we think we know and what is serving us and the people around us. What do we have? agency over what does that look like yeah I feel like I could just go on and on and on to answer this yeah I mean the thing that I'm hearing as the maybe the I don't know if salve is the right word but I hear self-trust and really yeah. being able to to know yourself and to build that self-trust that many of us uh don't have the opportunity to do you know growing mm -hmm. up in our families of origin well and also you know fear um feeling safe is a privilege mm, right yeah. um and we're not taught also to have compassion or grace for ourselves um Sonny Renee Taylor says the most like the most powerful antidote to a world of body terrorism is a world of compassion and giving yourself grace as an act of revolution mm -hmm. and so like just in the right those like two sentences like there's an invitation for grace and compassion and we are not taught that like no. we're taught like and conditioned to judge other people to compare um that what's normal right like quote and then like for folks not watching this like i'm quote unquote normal here is the cis white thin hetero um uh monogamous right uh mm -hmm. like that binary that's normal and, and when we have a concept of normal we're gonna we're gonna any if there's if there's a concept of normal we're gonna need labels for others right for mm -hmm. for those of us who don't fit into a lot of those identities mm -hmm. um so again queering up and questioning how we know what we think we know and um being around surrounded by community who can help keep people accountable to um, showing up in integrity, I think is really integral, really, really integral. So often, and especially as we talk about COVID, one of the things I hear frequently from clients is this, like it's exhausting loneliness. Mm -hmm. It's just like a consuming amount of loneliness. Um, and so a lot of it is encouraging community and leaning into community, knowing that anytime we enter into any relationship, we run the risk of hurt, either hurting people or, or getting hurt ourselves. Um, and it does take courage to do that, but it, it is so rewarding. I don't know like what I would have done, you know, as a person who doesn't often feel loneliness. I don't, I 
felt loneliness very rarely in my life, but I, I need community. I need folks in multiple communities and I need to be a part of their lives too. So it's a um, reciprocal relationship. Like it's, there's nurturing and there's healing done on a constant regular basis. Um, yeah. Yeah. And now I see your definition of yourself. Uh, what did you, an introverted, what? Relationship slut. Yes. <laughs> It's like claiming the, the, the slut piece again, because like, if we think about pleasure, there's only like so much pleasure that's quote unquote acceptable, right? Not too much, right? But like just enough, but that's also rooted in normal, right? And so by claiming labels like queer, like I'm very much queer. And, uh, and so like, again, bringing these back into the way that I identify, um, you know, I think it, it, it it's healing it's healing mm -hmm. in many ways yeah mm -hmm. a little jarring to people who are like what is this person talking about that they're a slut but like it is I am super relationship slutty I just I love them I love them so much and I have to be very particular Kristen about the relationships that I um, am in because I have to again that self-awareness piece like yeah. who is energizing and I don't ever want to be a person who takes people's energy like I'm very cognizant of that I don't want to be uh, in relationship with somebody who like I am taking their energy mm -hmm. um, want it to be I want it to be mutual want it to be yeah. helpful and, and restorative for for everybody involved yeah I think that that awareness is so much of it as well the intention and the awareness um, I feel the same way and I've certainly had a lot of relationships that involve energy vampires which then causes yeah. me to ask the question okay where which relationships am I the vampire in and how? Sure. Um, so that's, that's a good way to get curious too. Yeah. I love that introspection. I think I, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we grow without the invitation for introspection, which again, takes um, it's humility it goes mm -hmm. back to humility, right. To be humble and humility, not, not humiliation, right. Like right. humility to be humble over defensiveness at any given point. Um, it's not easy, uh, but I think with a lot of practice, it, it becomes a lot easier. It's like the more anti-racism work I do, the less white guilt I feel, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. it's, an, it's alignment between self and, and values and action. Yeah, and vulnerability is at the heart of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna say something before we we jet too about the word slut because an interesting conversation came up in my house the other day with my 13 year old. And I, I don't remember how she used it, but I think it was unintentionally derogatory. And so we had a big conversation about reclaiming that word mm -hmm. for ourselves and yeah. really embracing pleasure and uh, what our bodies can do for us. Um, and it was so great. I love right. It. I love that. Oh, you're such a good parent. Oh, how cool. And I know your kiddo is like super awesome too. So it's, it's so great. It's so great learning. And again, like that's an opportunity for learning that you didn't, you didn't like ignore that, right. You got curious about it. Kiddo felt like safe enough with you, right. To have that, um, and be open to having a conversation with you about it. Yeah. Um, and then if we want to get even further, it's like, well, what does slut even mean? Mm -hmm. Right. Like whose mm -hmm. judgment is that? And who, who's trying to shame who, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Love yeah. the patriarchy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, <laughs> for, <laughs> for those listening, we are going to come back and we have, I mean, at least two more episodes, but I yeah. feel like a million more that we could, um, that we're going to bring to life. So definitely awesome. come back and join us again. It was so amazing having you here. Oh, likewise, my friend. And thanks folks for listening. Oh, this has been so much fun. I can't believe this much time has gone by. Seriously, it's flown. Yeah. Um, tell everybody where they can find you. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so my, uh, my website is miafinetherapy.com. And, uh, or you can just Google Mia Fine, M-I-A-F-I-N-E, and I am there. Um, and we have this fabulous kick-ass sex therapy collective called the PNW, Sex Therapy Collective. And it's a group of us and we are expanding and 
a lot of us are sex therapists and sexuality educators, all in the field, um, sex professional field. Um, and you can learn a lot about us on our website. So you're welcome to reach out to us there. Our Instagram's not super active yet, uh, but it will be. And I am, my professional is back on. So it's Mia Fine, at Mia Fine dot sex therapy is my Instagram. So you can reach out there. And I'm more than happy to connect with folks who are listening. Reach out to me anytime. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I look forward to our next conversation. Likewise, Kristen, you're so, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you.